hard mode. So Brian and David, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm David Shua. I'm vice chair of the board of supervisors of the East Ocean Township, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the third of our sustainability advisory committee um, seminars via Zoom. Um, the first two are available on the East Goshen Township website on uh, geothermal and solar uh, applications for residential in, in the township. Uh, tonight's topic is composting for your garden in the age of COVID-19. I will confess that this Christmas I was the um, recipient of a composting a drum from my backyard and I've started composting myself. I have a lot to learn, so I'm looking forward to this uh, seminar. The first thing I had to learn is how to put together the composting drum, which was that we should have videotaped that. That was kind of humorous. Um, and uh, our moderator tonight is Brian Hutchinson, uh, who is a member of the uh, Sustainability Advisory Committee, but he knows of what he speaks. He is a master composter after having taken classes available through the Chester County Solid Waste Authority, uh, which is available on an annual basis if anyone's interested in, in uh, pursuing that, learning more about composting. Brian also has been composting for over 20 years, so he's got a you know, wealth of experience in uh, using his uh, compost for mulching his uh, flower beds and his vegetables. So, uh, Brian, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, David. Uh, welcome everyone. Again, my name is Brian Hutchinson and as David indicated, this is our third seminar that the East Ocean Sustainability Advisory Committee has produced. As David mentioned, uh, the first two were on solar, geothermal, and tax credits. You can find a recording of those seminars on the East Ocean Township website under the Sustainability Advisory Committee tab. Tonight's seminar is on composting, and the two presenters tonight are Rachel Joy Davis and Nathaniel Smith. The Sustainability, Sustainability Advisory Committee will have more Zoom seminars in the future, so keep a lookout for these in an email from uh, the East Ocean Township or the Sustainability Advisory Committee. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping issues before we dive into our seminar. Um, PowerPoint slides for those of you who are calling in, if you have not already been provided with the PowerPoint slides, you can access them by going onto the East Ocean website's calendar on the homepage and clicking onto the SAC seminar number three or under the Sustainability Advisory Committee page. Our speakers will indicate the slide number they are on so you can follow along while listening. Um, in terms of questions, we will hold questions until the end of the seminar. Uh, you can email us your questions at info at eastocean.org. Uh, you can send any time during the meeting and our panelists will field these questions at the end. The seminar will be recorded and posted to the East Ocean Sustainability Advisory Committee section of the township's website. So if you have friends, neighbors, or relatives that could not attend tonight's session, please let them know. Tonight, instead of a formal introduction to Rachel and Nathaniel, they will be providing you with this information in their presentation. So without further ado, I give the floor to Rachel and Nathaniel. Great, thank you, Brian. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. So as Brian mentioned, um, we are composting for your garden in the age of COVID-19 and Nathaniel and I will be presenting. I uh, just wanted to give a special thanks to the East Goshen Township SAC and Christy Marshall for helping organize this event tonight. And we all also hope that each of you are safe and well um, despite these times that we're living in, um, there are some hopeful moments and still moments of learning. And we welcome all questions and comments um, at the end of the presentation. Uh, Brian mentioned that this is the um, third seminar in an ongoing series sponsored by the East Ocean uh, SAC and additional upcoming Zoom seminars will be announced shortly. Again, here's the email 
Uh, in case you have any questions or comments, sac at eastgoshen.org. So tonight's agenda, we're going to do formal introductions of ourselves, we're going to discuss the local affiliate groups that we are part of and have contributed our time to. We'll talk about what compost is, the history of it, acceptable versus avoiding materials in compost. We'll talk, we will address compostable dishware, the chemistry and the final balance of compost, as well as each of our personal experiences with composting. Uh, we'll talk about how to compost inside your home and outside of it. We'll discuss all different types of containers, the cost, common problems, resources, why we want to compost at all, planetary and communi community benefits, as well as alternate options if you find yourself unable to compost on your own. We'll talk about local progress involving how COVID has disrupted things and the opportunity through which compost can make those better. Uh, I'll have Brian touch on his example as a master composter and gardener. Uh, we'll list some other examples happening in the Philly suburbs. And then at the end, we'll talk briefly about resources and statistics for Chester County and Pennsylvania. Um, so I was a Chester County resident uh, up until very recently. I just moved to Roxborough at the end of February. Um, but while I was in Chester County, I worked as a geologist in Malvern um, as well as a sustainability advisor for our business unit. And I have done much community work uh, with the Westchester Sustainability Advisory uh, Committee, as well as being a board member for the Don't Spray Me group, the Westchester Green Team. Um, I was a co-lead for the Plastic Free Please Action Group, uh, as well as a member of the Chester County Environmental Alliance. And I have a lot of um, experience going to schools and talking about sustainability and life as a female scientist. I really enjoy that. Um, and on my free time, I'm also an illustrator and a painter. Nathaniel? So can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you. Good. Well, my name is Nathaniel Smith. I live in the borough of Westchester. I've been here since 1986. And um, I do not have a particular background in science or environment. So I want to testify that those of us who don't have special backgrounds, nevertheless, can be part of this very important movement. And I think it's wonderful that those of us in on this call are getting together and people who are part of the SAC and the Westchester uh, SAC and anybody involved in local projects to make life better, to help the environment, it's a great thing. It's the, the best in our country and we need to keep at it. So I just believe, uh, as Garrison Keillor says, uh, one of my heroes, my contemporary, um, about shy people, they get up and do what need to be done, needs to be done. So that's what we're all doing, I think. That's my um, idea. So um, Rachel, do I just move down through uh, the following pages and do you, um, follow along on the screen? Is that the way it works? Or are people I'm following just, along at home? I'll, okay. I'll probably take note of your voice and go on to the next slide. But, oh, um, okay, yeah. well, um, I have had a role in uh, founding three local organizations. One is Don't Spray Me, uh, with an exclamation mark, whose motto is let's prevent unnecessary mosquito spraying in Chester County. We have not had any this summer, so that's good. And it uh, generally works against uh, chemical um, contamination and un unnecessary use of chemicals. So of course we're in favor of organic gardening and uh, composting. So another one uh, that I've been part of is the Westchester Green Team. And um, Rachel, you and I met at, at one of these events. It was a, um, a forum a couple of years ago at the Unitarian Congregation in Westchester. And you miraculously appeared and gave new energy to our groups. The Westchester Green Team uh, is an alliance of Don't Spray Me and uh, Chester County Citizens for Climate Protection, Ready for 100, which uh, works on renewable energy and the Plastic Free Please Action Group. So that's the Green Team and uh, you and East Goshen uh, are in the territory. It's roughly um, the area of the Westchester Area School Board. So please look us up. Uh, you can find the website um, in your handout, but it's wcgreenteam.com. And then, um, 
there's some photos, if you see those, of our kid uh, gardening program, which we call Roots and Shoots. And um, these photos show some, some of our valiant kids and our, our two um, um, student coaches who are Courtney Bodo and uh, Jordan Engel, doing a great job this summer. Um, and also, if you're looking at page, um, is that page uh, 10? Right now we're on 10, right? Yeah, you'll, you'll see in the upper right-hand corner, our, our designer, Linda Maxwell's backyard. It was a meadow, then it became a uh, garden, it got overgrown, and the top you see, uh, you see it in April and, or May, and then uh, you see it now, they've, they've really brought it back to life, and I was over there the other day, it's full of vegetables. So it can be done. Um, this is the lawn to garden movement that we're part of. And finally, the Chester County Environmental Alliance. And this is now 30 groups around the um, county. Um, SACs and EACs are welcome. And um, we, we work together to try to increase consciousness of um, the importance of environment and sustainability on the county level. And uh, the gentle reminder on the next page is we are not experts, especially me, but um, we, we learn. And later I'll say something. I, I just an hour ago made an experiment, Rachel. We were talking about um, whether I was really composting when I was burying my, um, some of my kitchen uh, recyclings. And now I, I didn't bury it anymore. So now it's not anaerobic anymore. So we're all learning, that's the point. Uh, Rachel, over to you, I think. All right, so um, what is composting? Um, if you're here listening to this webinar, you are probably most likely aware of some aspect of composting, uh, but the general uh, description is that it is using the natural process of decay to change organic waste into a valuable humus-like material called compost. Um, this is um, completed through the aerobic method of decay, which requires air, and in that air composition is oxygen. Uh, you can control the decay in, in a contained area uh, to speed up the process of this natural breakdown by using components, oxygen, water, food, and temperature to your benefit. Um, there's a lawnmower going by, so I apologize if you can hear that all. Um, fungi, earthworms, and other uh, detritivores further break off the material at a microscopic level and the process continues to recycle material that would otherwise end up in a landfill. So obviously things have been breaking down for millions of years. That's why we have soil horizons and uh, various soil compositions around the world. Uh, but it's been present and uh, demonstrated in written and visual history in many cultures for thousands of years. Uh, the First Nation, or otherwise known as Native American people, used fish guts and guts, uh, fish skins and guts as fertilizers. Um, in their soil. Um, a, a few Englishmen and uh, Austrian philosophers um, during the 20th century uh, experimented with different methods of composition and decomposition. And there are, of course, many other methods around the world. So you can see at the, at the bottom, uh, there's plenty of ways to break down your compost, and we will touch on a few of them. Um, so what can you add? I think this is Nathaniel's slide. Well, I have uh, personally added all of this stuff to my giant compost heap, except seaweed. I don't have a source of seaweed. Uh, and a manure, I actually got some. I didn't put it in the compost heap. I let it sit somewhere else and put it on the garden. But my theory is all of this stuff is useful. It all goes back to nature and then it's good for our uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, I, I want to explain what I was saying earlier. Um, <clears throat> because I do not have a covering around my compost, I don't have a tumbler and I don't have a fence with a lid on it, um, I have to keep anything edible out of my compost heap itself. I uh, thought for a while that if I put, um, you know, edibles like uh, peelings and pieces of carrots and so forth at the top, the animals would not get up that high, five feet off the ground, but that was incorrect. So then I've been burying them and putting a rock on top to keep out the 
uh, rodents. And just uh, a couple of hours ago, I tried putting on a wire mesh over my um, kitchen waste compost. Um, so it's sort of smelly, but it's sort of far from the neighbors. And that means I think it should be aerobic because the oxygen can get in. So now um, that qualifies as compost by Rachel's definition. Um, I think the next slide is what I should not add, page 17. Um, right, well, I, of course, stay away from pesticides. We had a black walnut tree, but we cut it down. Um, I do sneak in fish skins, but that's okay because the First Nations did that. But you do want to be careful, and particularly if your compost heap is, or tumbler is safe to uh, any living situation, it, it could be sort of stinky if you aren't careful. Rachel, to you, I think. So um, recently in the biodegradable engineering sphere, there's been a lot of work on creating compostable materials that we use in our everyday lives in order to combat the plastic problem that we have um, worldwide. So the Biodegradable Products Institute um, has certified certain products uh, that have come into their um, line of testing. Um, and if these products um, are certified by them, it means they break down in under 12 weeks in a composting um, situation. Um, but there are some plastic-like composting materials called PLA, uh, which are made from corn, that various studies say that they either do not break down or they break down anaerobically and release methane. So if you dispose of a plastic like corn fork into your trash, it will most likely not break down. If you put it into your backyard compost, it will break down, but very slowly. Um, there's here saying whether or not this type of material is better for the environment. Uh, overall, many scientists and uh, composting and gardeners uh, who work in this industry say that it is probably not. I think that's debatable. Um, the, you know, most compostable plastic food services are bio-based, so they are displacing fossil-based ingredients, uh, but they still can end up in a landfill and produce methane. So uh, six and one half dozen there, but I'd say if you're avoiding plastic and you're able to uh, cut these uh, compostable dishware materials up into pieces you're, and put them in your backyard, you're probably better off than using a plastic fork. And then I say, better not buy them at all, just bring your own uh, whenever you travel if you can. Um, so what does a composting require? Uh, through human management, aerobic conditions, and the development of internal biological heat, using these four critical ingredients, you can create a great compost. So uh, this is your top four things. You're going to need your carbon, your nitrogen, your oxygen, and your water. Your carbon is going to provide the energy component for the microbial oxidation of uh, the microbes are the microbes are breaking them down to produce the heat. Um, high carbon materials tend to be brown and dry. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, nitrogen filled materials grow and reproduce more organi organisms to oxidize the carbon present. And high nitrogen materials tend to be very green, such as kitchen waste and glass, uh, I'm sorry, grass clippings. They're often also, they have moisture, natural moisture content. The last two things are you're gonna need your oxygen for oxidizing the carbon to help in the decomposition process and you'll need water in the right amounts to maintain the activity of the, um, of the microbe uh, oxidation without causing an anaerobic condition. So your final balance of your compost should be roughly two to one to 10 to one. So I read a lot of papers uh, recently about the different carbon nitrogen uh, ratios and two to one to 10 to one seems to be kind of the best bet. So it's not a perfect science. It's what you have available, but any more than 10 to one, um, you risk uh, creating an unbalanced compost that won't break down in the way that you prefer it to. So again, that brown material is shredded dried leaves, fur, cloth, cardboard, paper, and the green material is fruits and vegetables, grass clippings, weeds, things like that. Your perfect compost, if there ever was such a thing, has a fine crumbly texture and a pleasant earthy smell. It should not be smelly. Uh, it should not be sticky or hard and um, uh, in big clumps. 
Um, and then a, a critical thing to when you're when you're finally using your compost is that you want the original ingredients that you used and you put into the pile, you, you shouldn't be able to see them any longer. And in order to continue to break down the and increase the decay process as fast as possible, you want to increase the surface area of that green and brown material by shredding the brown stuff and by cutting up or smashing your green stuff. Um, so it works through an aerobic condition. So the decomposers and the worms and the insects consume the oxygen while feeding on the organic matter present. So again, the nitrogen is coming from the food scraps and the clippings. The dry brown materials are adding the carbon in, which is the building cells for the composting organism's growth. The water is added in if there's not enough moisture. All of this creates heat and CO2 and water vapor. Composting is the most efficient when you've controlled these um, parameters. Carbon dioxide and water is lost so that half of the weight of the initial organic materials is reduced. Uh, this is really important um, in reducing the amount of volume that we can send to a landfill. And of course, anaerobic conditions are without oxygen. So food scraps and clippings and those dry brown materials, when they don't have oxygen, they produce methane and they do not really create a good compost. They do break down, uh, but not uh, exactly what you want for your um, garden. So, and this is just a little bit of science. As you can see on the left, the temperature is higher um, in the first 20 days of decomposition. All that heat is generated, all those things are breaking down. Um, as you can see, the greater the carbon content, so the, so the more of that brown material, you actually don't get as high a temperature and it takes a lot longer to decay. Um, in this um, cutout, graph right here to your right, or this table rather, um, you can see the natural uh, ratios uh, for all of these different materials. So if you're thinking of adding in corn stalks to your composition, remember that corn actually has a natural higher content of carbon to nitrogen. So you want to add something in like uh, food scraps to reduce the amount of carbon and increase the nitrogen content. Uh, Nathaniel? Okay, um, well, if you're on page 23, you see my uh, large compost heap at the upper right. The shovel shows the measurement, and it's about 20 feet long. Um, I have never been able to make a compost heap get hot. Just doesn't seem to happen for me. I, I turn it over, and in fact, uh, I move it from left to right. The gap there now has been filled in, and I'm, I've got a gap uh, to the side. I am sort of an experimenter. And uh, I had a friend who had a um, yoga store, and she said she wanted to know whether her yoga containers and spoons really uh, biodegraded, as the manufacturer claimed. I, I, I put them in my heap and photographed them over a period of months. And as Rachel said, very, very slowly, they did finally go away. But I do want to report that some packing materials, um, like those uh, used by Bob's Red Mill, I got a shipment the other day, um, I don't know what they're made out of, but I put them on the compost heap and I poured water on them and they just sort of liquefied and went away. Um, so it's sort of fun to experiment. In the best of conditions at the bottom of the compost heap, when I remove the stuff off the top, it's almost like peat. It's really, it's really beautiful. It's uh, fluffy and dry and you run it through your fingers. Very satisfying. As you see in the photo, I tend to have too many sticks, although that probably helps the air to circulate, but eventually they, they break down. So I regard this as being the patient compost system. Um, if you allow sticks in your compost heap, just be sure that they're not so sturdy as to allow a shelter to rodents to build, for rodents to build a nest in. You don't want that. That's uh, the end of my experience. Thanks, Nathaniel. Um, so I grew up in media, um, uh, less than a one acre property. So you can see in the top right, um, I was really inspired by my mom who's always been out in nature. Both my parents love nature. And so uh, really getting dirty, getting my, getting my fingers all uh, soiled and um, being really involved with the waste product produced in our home um, was fun for us. So growing up, we did the very low cost, low maintenance option of just storing uh, compost 
pretty compost material, so scraps and things from our kitchens, just storing them temporarily in his old Ziploc bag in the lower fridge drawer or at the sink edge until you can move them outside. Uh, the bottom center photo is a photo from last year of my parents' compost pile, one of their compost piles. As you can see, it's got a lot of brown material, but they add in the green material um, every once in a while. Um, chemical free use and um, I have experienced some ants and fruit flies inside, uh, but a quick cleanup of the temporary compost area uh, really helps um, get rid of that. And then squirrels and birds are usually uh, the first to attack the pile when new green material is, but they eventually leave and they help break down uh, it in nature anyway. Um, I found smashing the material up into a bunch of pieces is great exercise. And uh, in the bottom right hand corner, um, we're now growing tomatoes and zucchini in five gallon buckets in Roxborough. So that's been exciting. All right, we're on slide 25, how to compost. Um, so we're gonna address a number of ways you can compost inside your home or out. So um, if you don't have a yard, it's not a problem. There's a lot of things you can do. So you can start a general collection area in your kitchen by using any of the containers that you see in the top right, or as I have done, an extra bag or an, uh, an extra uh, plastic Ziploc with a top uh, container, uh, any plastic container, or whatever you have in your kitchen is fine for temporary holding. Um, you can also get a self-sufficient compost system, um, which is, uh, they're a little bit more expensive, but as you can see in the bottom two right containers, I'm sorry, the bottom two right photos, you can see that this is a self-efficient system where you add in your, uh, gr your green material and then it, you add in brown material from, your, uh, from wherever you can get it and it does break down, but it also breaks down naturally without the brown material. So those systems are set up so that you don't need brown material, um, but adding it in can really help. Um, you can also just use a five gallon bucket by putting six inches of brown material in the bucket and then the, leaving the top 12 inches of the bucket available for that green material, it creates a nice ratio of carbon to nitrogen. You can do this in your kitchen very easily. Um, my friend and uh, business owner for Backyard Eats, Chris Mattingly, I think he's on the call, he recommended getting a screw top lid for the five gallon bucket, not the prying kind, they're a little bit harder to open, kind of break your nails. So that's a little insider tip right there. Um, there's also vermicompost. So I dove deep and I watched a, a two hour video about the hungry bin on the left and I'm pretty convinced it's the best thing out there. Um, but it's a self-contained system. It's about three feet tall. You put it outside, you kind of forget about it. But basically, uh, it, you add in your food scraps and a little bit of brown material, and you add in your worms, and the whole thing breaks down so that the material that you want uh, that is ready to put into your compost, it comes out the bottom when you take off that bottom tray, you unlatch it, and it naturally kind of comes down and falls out. And then you just keep adding food material into the top. You can also get a tumbler. You add one shovel of soil from your yard into the tumbler to add those local microbes that are gonna help break down the material. And all you do is you just add in your browns and your greens and you spin it. And then eventually when you're done, uh, you'll be able to scoop out the material that you want. So I would avoid putting anything big like a stick in here um, or anything that is uh, too brown of a material that's not gonna break down very fast. Nathaniel? So uh, the, the pile with or without wire is much neater than my own compost. Um, and uh, as you see, the, the purpose is to keep out animals. And um, they are very ingenious, you know, although it's often said that gardening is not nature, gardens are not natural, but nevertheless, you learn a lot. And I have observed that um, rodents can get into almost anything and voles, which I've had go right through chicken wire. I tried once making a, um, an, an enclosed container of wood and they, they nod right into it. I've seen them come up under um, the type of plastic uh, compost bin that you, you put in your yard. So it's, it's a continuous interplay between what we want to do and what um, plants and animals want to do. But it's, a, it's always a learning experience. So that's my experience. You learn uh, according to your own needs in your own space and, and it's fun, I think. That's all. Okay. 
think you're presenting this one, Athena. Um, what? What does it cost? Uh, sorry, no, the the pallet one. Pallet. Oh, well, I'm not too sure. I mean, that's that's good advice, Rachel. I, I don't really have anything to add to what what you have there, and just put put it in a good place in your yard and make sure the neighbors don't complain. And yes, and of course, it needs to be well drained out of the way, uh, fairly level or it'll fall over. Um, but you know, you can experiment, move it around. Okay. It's all good. I think, um, I think you skipped a slide. Uh, I'll just speak to the pallet slide. Um, this is actually after the pile slide. So, uh, this should be slide. Let's see. 25, 26, oh, 28, 29. 30. Slide 29. Is, 30. Uh, oh, 30. Thank you. 30 is the, is the pallet. So, uh, Backyard Eats uh, owner and founder uh, Chris Mattingly suggested that your pallet should be four feet wide on each side to really create that heat in the center of the pile. Um, and this one is a little bit, requires a little bit more physical movement for rotating the pile. So if you're not into um, getting yourself a little bit sweaty, then I wouldn't recommend this one. I'd go for more of the easy tumbler uh, if that's more aligned to your physical prowess. And again, Nathaniel touched on where to put um, the pile in your yard. So you want to put it where it's sunny. You need that sun to help break things down. Um, you want it on well-drained ground, so don't start your compost pile on a concrete surface. Um, you also want those natural microbes to come up from the ground into your pile. So don't put a tarp down on your yard and then put your compost down. You just want to put it right on the ground um, and tumblers can kind of go anywhere. Um, so we're on slide 32 to talk about cost. Uh, this is just a really easy breakdown. Um, if you're going to store the compost temporarily inside, there's some really fancy, beautiful compost pails out there with carbon filters in the top and anti-bug things. Um, you don't really need that. Uh, there are some other cheaper ones, but if you want it to be pretty and aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing in your kitchen, you can go with a $30 pail from Target. Um, and they are really nice. They're in our office right now. Um, the gallon, the five gallon buckets you can get at Lowe's for $3. Uh, if you have a shovel, gloves, those things cost less than $10. Wood pallets can be free. You can pick them up at uh, different various places or you can buy them online uh, for $200. That's the cheapest one I saw for like a bunch of wood pallets. Tumblers range in price from $50 to $600 or more, depending on uh, what you want to um, invest. Uh, it's out there for you. Um, and then composting thermometers are good to have on hand. So you can see just kind of what's going on in your pile. Uh, and they, they started about $20. And then of course, your waste that you've already produced, you're gonna throw out anyway, is free. Uh, we're on slide 33, Nathaniel. Okay, 33. Is that about need brown material? Yes. I, um, I have two neighbors that, um, they, they've said to me, do you have any extra leaves? I really need them for my compost heap. <laughs> and I said, wow, do I have extra leaves? So I uh, happily donated leaves to them. So they, they, they knew about the right balance of um, brown and green. Um, so, uh, you know, if you have too many leaves, uh, check, with, check with your neighbors. If you don't have enough, check with your neighbors. Um, I think I'm on the next one, which is about problems. Um, now the little uh, cartoon figure is holding his nose. Yeah, um, I see that. I think in the picture here, there's some worms. I was so happy uh, the other day, I was digging down in my compost heap and I found a whole layer of really good soil in the middle, which was unusual and there were worms in it. So I was really working well. Um, slide 35, um, about common problems. Um, my compost smells like poo. Well, yes. Um, I have the bad habit of uh, moving my kitchen compost out of the garage in a container, which sort of adds up over the week. And boy, that really stinks. But I figure it's sort of breaking down. Um, and then I, when it stinks too badly, then I put it in the ground. Um, when it gets slimy, well, I, I put it out. You know, you don't always have these luxuries if it's sitting in your kitchen. You've got to move it along. Um, the third problem is if your compost heap is too dry, the place in my yard where I put mine is under some old cedar trees, which are slowly dry, uh, dying back from the bottom. 
So the good news is my compost heap is getting more sun and more water now. Um, but yes, I do occasionally have to put some, some, um, some water on it. Otherwise the leaves particularly just sort of sit there. So I, I'd say the operating principle is keep an eye on it, see how it's doing and uh, help it along. Um, so I added this slide, slide 36. It's a few online and offline resources. Um, I just want to remind everyone, a few gardeners get their compost right the first time. So reach out to people who have already kind of dipped their hands into it. Um, Lee Reich has a website and he works on his farm den. He's got some great videos, very calm presence and very uh, reassuring if you have questions. Uh, I mentioned Chris Mattingly who runs BackyardEats.com. He started a raised bed gardening and uh, garden, gardening tending company in the Philadelphia area. And he's got a wealth of information about gardens and composting. Um, Uncle Jim Worms Farm is located in Avongrove and they have all sorts of resources uh, that you can use and you can order worms and all different sorts of other materials from his website. Uh, Amy Landers started gardensthatmatter.com and she is available by email at Amy at gardensthatmatter.com, and uh, she's a great resource I found. Um, Courtney Bodel is part of the Westchester, Westchester and Westchester University Sustainability Communities, and she helps run a few gardens in the Chester County area. Great resource uh, for working with children as well. Uh, we've already mentioned the green team uh, in Westchester. They also have an Instagram, if you're uh, Instagram savvy, so you can check them out. And Bennett Compost, um, in the city is great uh, for any questions and also for picking up your compost, which I'll touch on in a minute. And then the Rodale Institute um, in Pennsylvania is a great local university for uh, helping with questions and reaching out uh, if you have any um, unanswered things that you need to figure out. So we're on slide 38, I believe this is Nathaniel. Is this the one that says benefits for you and your community? Yes, sir. Well, um, I like to look at these things philosophically. We, we know that people have gotten too far away from nature. We're lucky in our area out here in Chester County um, to have trees and land and space around us to grow our vegetables and compost things. And we can afford to be the opposite of agribusiness. In other words, we don't want to depend on chemicals. We want to depend on natural substances such as compost. And we don't want to send waste to the landfill when we don't have to. Among other things, it costs our municipality about 10 cents a pound. So why should we do that when we can compost it? And um, we want to limit any chemical um, contaminants uh, any pesticides, herbicides, anything that has to do with petroleum. And we want the satisfaction of growing our own um, food within measure. And um, when children are involved, it's very educational for them. Maybe they didn't like to eat vegetables, but if they grow a vegetable, maybe they'll start feeling differently about it. And in the Green Team, we like to connect to the, um, the victory movement, climate victory movement, because it doesn't seem that an individual can defeat climate change, but we're part of a movement. Um, we produce less um, methane, less carbon dioxide, less waste. And um, if you think of going shopping um, in the supermarket, all that food got there on a truck, which probably used fossil fuel. Um, so it's part of uh, just trying to live in a, in a way that's a little bit more in harmony with um, the planet, as the next slide says, um, benefits for the planet and um, benefits for our own uh, peace of mind, really. The, the Westchester Green Team wants to stress things that people can do in their own lives to, to be more sustainable. So everything we're talking about tonight is part of that. Rachel? Hi. And there's some pretty clear benefits for the planet overall. Um, you can look at that slide later and also do your own research about what is the best um, composting and gardening atmospheres for your particular soil horizon. So we can talk about that if you have a question about your soil in your backyard as well. 
Um, so, you know, we've gone through all this. We've talked about the resources that you have at your fingertips and how easy it can be starting in your kitchen, moving to your yard. Um, there's a lot of free things that you have at uh, your disposal. But if you still find yourself unwilling to kind of give in and uh, start at your own uh, compost pile, you can have someone else do it for you. So Bennett Compost will actually pick up your scraps and put it, and you put it in a bucket and they'll pick it up in the morning on Monday and then twice a year they sell their compost. Um, so that's a great resource as well. And that's just out of your hands. You don't even need to worry about it. Back to Earth Compost is a local Chester County female founded company. Uh, it's just a mom. She started to uh, started this company and her website's there for more information. And we're on slide 42. So touching back to the title of this presentation, Composting in the Age of COVID, um, we want to touch on that, you know, this is a really grounding exercise for you in such a very unstable time. You can feel more connected to nature, your family, your friends, the things around you, um, and it will actually really help with your mental health. But you want to do it in a safe way. So if you are going to be doing it, with other people, remember to wear your mask and socially distance within the garden. Um, always wash your hands, not just because of the soil, but also because of any risks to yourself. Um, in this time, most people are gardening more. So thinking about creating your own fertilizer is actually something that will save you a lot of money when people are going out and demanding more for these very simple items. Um, so you're actually helping to save money um, as well. Um, composting brings us back to our natural roots and really reduces anxiety. And um, remember always that you don't want to add any medical waste in or around your compost. Um, and you can wash your hand tools and leave them in the sun to dry to kill off anything you think might be there. So Brian Hutchinson, um, who is moderator on this presentation, is going to touch on this slide uh, in his composting gardening exercises in Westchester, PA. Thanks, Rachel. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, basically I had a pile of wood chips that got delivered. Uh, we were expanding a front yard garden and I decided, did some research on the Berkeley method to break down uh, compost. Uh, apparently with the Berkeley method, if you do it correctly, it's a hot composting method to break uh, the organic materials down quicker. Supposedly, the Berkeley method, if you, if you do it correctly, you can break down compost in about three weeks. Um, as you can see in the upper left corner, that was what the wood chips started out as. Um, I basically built a compost bin from an old uh, sandbox, two sandboxes, just took uh, scrap wood, uh, purchased some chicken wire for $35, and I bought myself a uh, compost thermometer and it was kind of interesting to see that um, what I tried to do is make sure that I layered the wood chips every three or four inches with uh, one to three inches of grass clippings. And uh, before I did the grass clippings, I basically had, had uh, taken the wood chips back from the front yard to the backyard and there really wasn't any heat being produced. So after uh, uh, two days of layering it with the grass clippings, the temperature, as you can see, jumped up to about 130 degrees, which is a nice, nice active uh, top uh, temperature to break down the organic materials. Now, because I'm using wood chips, wood chips have a, you know, they're fairly large and very porous. Uh, they will take a little bit longer. So like Nathaniel said, I'm looking forward to the fall when I could try this method with um, uh, brown leaves and see if um, you can actually get to the 20, 20 or 24 days that they, uh, they say that the Berkeley method can do. Um, it does take a fair amount of size. It's about a one meter by one meter, three feet, three and a half, four feet. So um, unless, Unless you have a young uh, son or daughter that wants to uh, volunteer to do this, I I'm out there every couple of days shoveling back and forth. So that's it awesome. for me. 
Thanks, Brian. Um, these are just a few other examples of what's happening in the Philly suburbs. Um, on top left, you can see that you can grow your vegetables directly next to a leaf mold pile. Uh, so those roots are actually going to pull from the brown uh, material that's decaying. It doesn't need to be on top. So again, no compost pile is perfect. No garden is perfect. Whatever works for you. Uh, bottom center is a compost pile without wire mesh. So you can see there's some, some nice big squash plants coming up. There's some uh, plants growing and compost breaking down in various buckets. Uh, shout out to my parents for this lovely view. And again, top is another leaf mold pile breaking down. Uh, Bennett Compost likes to post a lot of photos of what they're doing. And uh, top right is actually a scrap that I grew from a celery plant, which is now flourishing. So that's a, a whole other topic about savoring, saving your scraps to grow uh, plants again. Um, if you want any advice on that, I'd be happy to touch on that. Um, let's see, we're on slide 45 here. I think this is Nathaniel's slide and we have a couple, we're gonna wrap up. We realize it's 747, so we're gonna move through these quickly so we can reach some questions. So Nathaniel, do you wanna to talk to Chester County in Pennsylvania? Yep. Well, the Solid Waste Authority does have wonderful resources online. Um, please check in there. They've got videos and facts. Um, we should not be wasting all the things we waste in this country. And we all know something like half of the food grown in the country is thrown out. This is just un unacceptable. Um, the goal should be to recycle 100% of municipal waste. There's, there's some country where basically, I think it may be Denmark, Finland, everything is recycled. And we, we need to get there somehow. Slide um, 46 shows that um, of all the stuff that goes into the landfill in the country, 25% um, is, is food and yard recyclables. Those are things that we shouldn't be going into the landfills at all. So we, we need to be holding on to those. Um, it's, it's terrible to waste food and it makes you feel better if you uh, grow it or recycle it. If we have potatoes that somehow got too old, sweet potatoes, and uh, we can say, oh, let's, let's grow those. That's, that's very satisfying. That's cutting down on waste. Um, it's making new, new plants which produce food. So um, I, I keep thinking, this is, this is fun. I, I enjoy this. I hope you all enjoy it. All right, I'm ready for questions. Rachel? Uh, yep, just a couple more slides. Um, just a connection back to sustainability. So uh, Nathaniel and I are obviously very involved in our community, and we'd like you to be as well if you aren't already. But the general connection to sustainability is that by advancing these processes at your own home, um, can, it can really reduce the amount of uh, waste that we send to landfills, as Nathaniel touched on. Um, there's more and more evidence that mechanical sorting at industrial composting facilities is uh, really fantastic by decreasing anaerobic digestion and um, by also um, encouraging uh, more compostable materials to be used. So a lot of uh, you know, compostable or biodegradable uh, dishware and silverware says it's only recycled in an industrial composting facility. And these are going to keep uh, growing and being created around the, around the world to accommodate these uh, new materials. Um, and uh, of course, we're always trying to avoid the fugitive methane uh, as well. Um, Let's see, we've got local progress and initiatives. This is, we talk, talked a little bit about this. You can read the slide on your own, uh, but basically there's a lot of work going on locally. There's the plastic single use bag ban that uh, went into effect on July 2nd of 2020. Um, that is actually in a voluntary uh, portion right now, but there's some really amazing things happening with environmental education, plastic reduction, uh, children's education, um, and also hands-on learning opportunities in spite of COVID-19, uh, people are still getting uh, together and learning. So there are things out there if you wanna be involved, um, there are opportunities. So general resources, and then a last quote from Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So don't think that what you're doing is, is small. Uh, it's actually on a grand scale, it's, it's really wonderful. So thank you, here are our email addresses and uh, we'll field some questions now. 
So Rachel, I think you have the three questions that were posed before um, before we started the seminar. If you want to read those out and you and Daniel address those. Yes. Um, let's see. Can everyone still see my screen with the presentation on it? Yes. Okay. Uh, so one of the questions we received um, ahead of time was that um, someone had a tumbler composter and they needed to get rid of some of the compost, but uh, they thought they needed to, but they really wanted it to break down quicker. What could they do to break down this quicker? So um, after consulting some resources, we figured out that they prob the tumbler composter probably needs more ground material. Um, if it's too bone dry, it probably needs some moisture. And if it's too moist, it needs brown stuff. So reevaluate what's in your tumbler and see if you need to increase or decrease your carbon content. Um, wet material, at just adding wet material in general doesn't really do much, but um, and adding paper as a brown material doesn't really have the textural properties as coconut coir or leaves. So just kind of be careful about what you're adding but um, reassessing your carbon nitrogen um, ratio is probably the, the key to answering that. Um, another person said they planted a fig tree at one end of their compost pile. They're researching the best nutrients for this tree. Any thoughts on what is the best compost for a fig tree? Again, researching, consulting, uh, any compost is good. Leaf, mold, uh, composted manure has the macro micronutrients that your soil may need. Uh, composted manure is high in nutrients. Leaf compost you can add once to twice a year for the most beneficial um, nutrient value. And I want to uh, let people remind them that leaf mold is actually not mold. It's just the technical term for the breakdown of leaves um, and only leaves. So nothing else added in. Uh, if you want to add composted manure, uh, you can do that about one to two times a year, about a half inch is good. And preferably add your compost in the fall and the spring as these are your prime growing times. Um, another question came in about where to get a turning composting bin. I see them on Amazon, but I'm open to other suggestions. So there are many other sites besides Amazon if you don't feel like supporting a trillionaire. Uh, there's a composter called Jora, that's J as in Julie, O as in oxygen, R as in Rachel, A as in apple. That's not the military way of uh, designating the letters, but that's just what came to mind. So Jora composters, they produce some really high efficiency composters. Some of them have two chambers that work one at a time, so you can let that one finish and spin it while you add your new material to the second composting chamber. Uh, these are good for big volume areas, uh, but you can buy smaller ones for your yard. And you want to make sure, um, as I said already, to add a shovel of soil to each batch of your turning compost bin so that your natural microbes uh, can flourish. Um, someone else wrote in about a twin barrel composter. She's added vegetable scraps and coconut coir and also supplemented the material with a compost starter which is akin to the shovel of soil from your backyard. She keeps it slightly moist, tumbles it every few days, but the temperature still isn't getting hot. So it sounds like you are doing everything right. Um, if it's material wise, you want to have the moisture be as if it's a wrung out sponge. Uh, the microbes need that moisture medium to move across side to side and throughout the mixture. So make sure that your moisture content is right. And you can also, if you're just adding in your coir dry, you can pre-wet the coir, which helps it break down. Uh, if you don't know the exact temperature, I recommend getting that um, temperature uh, gauge and seeing exactly what you're doing. Um, again, we can touch base if those things don't work for you. And I think that's it for the questions I received ahead of time. So right now there are no further questions uh, that have been asked by our group. So uh, the only thing that I wanted to add is uh, the nice thing about a vegetable garden using compost is the surprise vegetables you get with compost. Um, I am now getting cucumbers and melons as a result of the compost 
uh, seeds that were in that lasted in the compost. So I've got some nice surprises in the, in the garden. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I want to I want to end the meeting. I guess uh, I want to first thank Rachel uh, and Nathaniel for the rather extensive uh, PowerPoint. I really appreciate you going to all the time and effort. Um, David, do you want to uh, say some final words? Yes, thank you. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Nathaniel and Rachel and you, to, you as well, Brian, for sharing your experience. Um, I will just quickly share that I bought a stainless steel carbon filter bucket for inside my house and it works amazingly well. You can put uh, vegetable and fruit scraps in it and no odor at all in, in the kitchen. They really work well. And then I carry the bucket out to my tumbler and I have a, a twin uh, chamber tumbler um, and I'm anxious to get my first yield out of out of the tumbler in, into the garden. So uh, uh, I encourage everybody to, uh, you know, normally this stuff goes down the garbage disposal or thrown into landfill and uh, there's a much better use for it at your own home. And, and it's easy to do and, and can be fun. Uh, and I learned a lot tonight, thank you very much. I learned, I think that I'm not putting enough brown uh, material in my tumbler and I'm gonna <laughs> remedy that when I get home. Um, so I really appreciate um, all the uh, uh, information about resources. Uh, thank the uh, East Ocean Township uh, Sustainability Advisory uh, Committee for their, um, uh, sponsoring uh, and uh, putting on these seminars. And again, this is a uh, seminar will be available on the East Goshen Township website under the uh, Sustainability Advisory Committee tab. With that, I will thank everybody and sign off. Well, thank, thank you very you much. Thank you. Good night. Thank you all. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you.